with you tonight. Um, would you guys be okay if I take off my shoes? Would it be all right? I'm feeling a little uncomfortable in those, are they called booties? <laughs> I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains, and believe it or not, it is true, people in the Appalachian Mountains do go barefooted all the time, but this feels more comfortable to me. And my daughter is with me tonight. Her name is Sophia. Sophie, say hi to everybody. Um, Sophie's getting ready to go back to Clemson tomorrow. How about those Tigers? Yay. Any Tiger fans in the house? All right. <laughs> Sophie's a junior at um, Clemson, so it, it's, it's a real joy that she, she wrote in with, uh, from Charleston with me tonight. But I am so honored, beautiful daughters, to be with you. You have been prayed for for weeks. You have been prayed for for months. This speaking engagement has been on the calendar for a very, very long time. And I know your leadership team has been praying for you. I've been praying for you. And it is no accident that you're sitting in this chair tonight where you are. So I want to open, <coughs> excuse me, let me clear my throat. I want to open before I begin the message just one more time because I need to ask the Lord to take over. Father, thank you for these beautiful, beautiful daughters. Thank you, God, that you knew them even before their mother <clears throat> and father knew them. You created them in their mother's womb, and they are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you know that full well. I pray, God, tonight that as I speak, you would capture their heart, and they would remember from this time together who their real father is. More clearly defining for them the role of daughterhood. So God, I beg you to speak through me. I beg you to send your Holy Spirit. And we're looking for you to show up in Jesus' name. <coughs> Excuse me. How many of you take biology? I know we've got 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders in here, right? Raise your hand high. I was a biology teacher for 28 years. Um, I'm a retired teacher now. I had a mold exposure, crazy long story, but I'm really enjoying being out of the classroom. When I taught that genetics unit, um, have you covered that unit yet? Genetics? All right. There was a lab that my students loved. And as teachers, we would always try to integrate cross-curricular activities in, like we would try to bring math into science, and that's a real teachy term, but when you did that, it was a good thing in teaching. So when we got to this genetics unit, we always brought out quarters for, have you done this lab before? What? Making a baby. You've done that lab, right? What's your name? Melita. Why don't you tell them what that lab's like? Uh... <laughs> Okay, so like you flip a coin and like heads and tails, like one represents mom, one represents dad. So like whatever you land on, like recessive or like dominant would be like your mom and what trait you get. So like I, Taylor, um, what type of color eyes and hair, stuff like that. Okay, Melita, right? She's exactly right. By the flipping of the coin, you would often talk about your genetic traits and there was one particular question on that lab report where you tested for boy, girl. You tested, you flipped a coin lots of different times and doing probability and statistics, you would try to figure out the chances of this couple having a boy or having a girl. That particular spot in the human genome is the 23rd chromosome spot. You have 23 chromosomes per body cell, that makes you human. And if you're in this room tonight and you're breathing, you're a girl, and that particular spot, you got an X from your dad instead of a Y. The guys who are out by the fire, their father donated a Y, and it made them a boy. So let's talk just for a minute about this big deal, and you can go ahead and start the slideshow. Let's talk about this big deal about the X 
chromosome, if you wouldn't mind putting that up, XX, you all have it. We share that in this room at spot 23. Do you know what that means for you as a girl? Well, first of all, you're way more beautiful, right? <laughs> but here's some science for you. Your stomach, your liver, and your kidneys and appendix are larger than a boy's. Yes. But a guy has larger, larger lungs. They can actually hold air to a larger capacity than girls can. You know what else that means for you? You are more left-brained. That means that you are more verbal. Guys aren't nearly as verbal as girls. You tend to cry a little bit easier because that left brain dominance makes you a little bit more tender-hearted than a guy. Your handwriting, girls, you'll bring out the scented crayons. You will bring out the curly cues. And even when you break up with your boyfriend, you'll probably put a smiley face at the end of it. Boys, when they write, chicken scratch. Bathrooms, when you go into the bathroom for girls, for us, it can become like a social lounge. I mean, I don't even know you. But if we, like, went to the restroom and you were in there and I was in there, we would probably, I'd probably say, hey, how's your day going? And we would be like in this, diet. is it true? Am I telling you the truth? Guys, honestly, they will not even make eye contact. They go in, use the bathroom. They don't even know if anybody else is in there. They walk out. Grocery store, you girls all week long probably have somewhere in your, like, legal planner or on your locker pad, oh, at home I'm out of Tootsie Pops. And you're making a list. Guys, they go in a grocery store, and they don't even know why they're there. If it looks good, they just throw it in the cart. <laughs> this stuff is real, right? You, as a female, are way different than those XYs out at the fire pit. And you're not a flip of the quarter coin. I'm not even a good catcher. Just leave it. You're not just a spot on the 23, 23rd chromosome you are a beautiful daughter. When we talk about this topic of daughterhood, it's a way different definition than girl. Girl is being, which we've been talking about, is of the female gender. Daughterhood is in relationship to a parent. Ladies, you will enter the right daughter story when you understand the right father story. I'm going to say that again. You will enter the right daughter story when you understand the right father story. I don't know what your father story is. I know what mine is. But I can tell by the look in some of your faces, and I don't even know you, that you've already had some wounding in that area. Your relationship with your father is probably the most important relationship of your life. And for some of you, when I say the word father, you smile because your dad is at home waiting on you and he's staying up late waiting on you and he's at the threshold of your door and he's saying, come in, honey. I can't wait to see you tonight. And he's hugging you and he said, how's your day, sweetie? That might be some of your stories. It wasn't mine. For some of you, when I say the word father, you may have a dad at home, but his door may be closed, and it might have a sign on the door that says, do not disturb. 
and you've knocked on that door so many times. Daddy, I'm busy. Daddy, busy. Some of you may go home tonight and you haven't seen your dad in a long time. As a matter of fact, you may have never seen him. So our father stories are all different. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about mine at the end. But I've got to tell you about the father you need to know about. Josie, I need you up on stage. She up there? You can start. You see, ladies, long before, long before, you ever sperm and egg came together. You had a father in heaven who thought about you and knit you together in your mother's womb from head to toe. He knows your hair color. He knows the width of your eye span. He knows whether your earlobes are attached or unattached. He was there weaving you. The entire time. You know how I know this? Because in scripture beginning in Genesis 1. He's rolling out your birth plan. Have you ever read Genesis 1? Next slide on the five points of a story. You see if you have an English class. You know there's five parts to every story. Right? Right? There's an exposition. There's a beginning part. There's a rising action. There's a climax. There's a falling action. And there's a resolution. It is no different in God's man and Mary. And girls, if you're sitting here tonight and you're breathing, you've got the XX and you do, you're in that story. You are in God's meta narrative. Whether you agree with it or not, you are here and you are in his story. And you, you want to talk about nursery preparation? You want to talk about the level of intimacy? Because he can't stand to be without you. So you want to see some nursery prep? Let's look at Genesis 1. Next slide. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless and void, and darkness covered over the deep. And God's spirit was hovering over the deep. And on the first day, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. He's getting ready for his daughters. He's getting ready. You can keep playing, Josie. He's getting ready for his daughters. And the first thing he said they'll need to know, they'll need to know, is the difference between light and dark. And he showed that to you on the first day. I hope after this you'll never look at creation the same. Because he's rolling out your birth plan. He's getting ready for you. On day two, he said, mm, Bluffton, sunny, near the coast. My daughters, they're going to need some cloud protection. And they're also going to need rain. Because they're going to need food and they're going to need to eat. So for my daughters in Bluffton, let me separate water from water. And I think I'll give them a sky. Day three, you like to eat? He thought of that too. He said, they're going to need food. Next slide. So I'm going to separate the water from the land, and that's where they're going to get their plants. Day four, next slide. You like being on schedule? He thought about that too, daughters. Can you imagine what your life would look like without day and night? We wouldn't even know when to sleep and when to get up. I went to Iceland this summer. I was so confused. There's only like four hours of, of, of darkness over there. I was wide awake at two in the morning. I'm like, what the heck? Because my rhythms were up. Daughters, he knows you need sleep tonight. 
He knows all about your schedule. And he put every single thing in motion. The sun, all the rhythm of the sun. This is your birthday. 365, 365 days. You celebrate every year. And he loves your birthday. Day five. Next slide. He knew you would live in Bluffton one day. He knew you would like seafood probably. He knew you would like the birds. Can you imagine what your life would be like without birds and fish? He thought of you rolling out your birth plan. Day six, you like your pets? You like wild animals? I love to go to the zoo. I'm a biology major. I beat that stuff up. He was thinking of you, daughter. But on the last day, this day was very different. This was the day that his beautiful daughters showed up on the planet. I'm going to read to you from Genesis 1 again. And so the Lord God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He literally put his mouth. This was the only part of creation where we see God getting very personal with his mouth. And he put his mouth to man and breathed his life into him. And out of Adam, he took a rib and he created woman. And you are here. Have you ever stopped to consider the work and the intimacy that God put in? That's, it's the first thing he did, ladies, when he showed the, the first pages of the Bible. He is showing up as creator God. Have you ever stopped to consider that day one through six was your nursery? It's what God put together to be able to relate to you. It's amazing when you think about that. Go back to the slide about the narrative, about the the five points of a story. So that's the exposition in God's metanoia, right? He is laying the groundwork. He is forming the plot. He is putting things together on planet earth for his daughters and sons and sons. But we're specifically addressing you tonight. The guys are getting a different message. So what happened next in God's story? Who knows? Raise your hand if you know. What? Rachel, what happened next? Um, <laughs> Eve fell to temptation and sin was brought into the world. Yeah. In Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to read it to you, and we're in the rising action right now of God's story. This is God's meta narrative, and you're in it. Whether you belong to God or you don't belong to God or you don't, you agree or disagree with everything I'm saying is irrelevant because if you're here, you're in God's story because he allowed you to be born. And you're in his story. So in Genesis 3, we, well, actually, I'm going to read in 2. The Lord God, this is Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when, surely when you eat of it, you will die. And your name was Rachel. And Rachel, she's read ahead. She knows what happened. Eve, the serpent, took Eve, began a conversation with her. 
and she fell into temptation. There were two trees in the center of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he said, see, every good parent sets boundaries, right? Boundaries make you secure. And you don't like them probably as a high school student, but boundaries actually are very good for you. If, if, they're, if they're fair and reasonable, boundaries are good. It actually gives you security. God set boundaries for his kids. And he told them, he said, you can eat of anything in here, but don't eat of that tree. Because if you do, you'll surely die. Well, we know the story. They ate. Now, did Adam and Eve die? No. They didn't die physically. What was God talking about? When he said you'll die, what was he talking about? What was, what was, what was dead? Do you know? It was their relationship. It was their relationship. Spiritually, at that moment, they were cut off from God. And this, ladies, is the rising action. Put up the, the picture of the heart, please. I draw four cups to illustrate to you what happened that day. This is a critical part of you understanding your daughterhood. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, he says, may God, and this is an amazing psychology verse. All of, all of psychology could be based on this verse. It says, may God himself sanctify you through and through. May your whole body, soul, and spirit, pay attention to that, body, soul, and spirit be kept blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus. And the one who has called you is faithful and he will do it. Now, what is that verse telling us? Daughters, you're a trichotomy. You are Adam and Eve's seeds. Every human being on the face of the globe, no matter what your tribe and tongue is, you go back to Adam and Eve. That is our original parents. And because you are Adam's seed, Romans 5, 1 says, therefore sin entered into the one man. And because the one man sinned, death came to that man and all people because all have sinned. So you were born broken. That's really hard to hear. It was for me the first time I ever heard it. I'm like, what? Have you ever, have you, have you daughters ever babysat? Have you ever babysat? Okay, what's your name? Kate? When you babysit, do your little people that you babysit for do exactly what you tell them to do every time you tell them to do it? They ignore. Well, it depends on, like, what I'm asking because a lot of times they'll, like, run away or, like, they'll go do something else. Right. If you say to a certain child, you know, stand right here, don't move from that spot, what nine times out of ten happens? <laughs> they don't. That's right. That's right. If you don't believe you're broken at birth, go babysit. Get a babysitting job. Get a babysitting job. And those little cute little things, I'm telling you what, when you spend 30 minutes, just 30 minutes, you're like, there's something wrong here. Right? Because when you tell them to do something, they do the opposite. Guys, it happened in the garden. It's the rising action. They're Adam's seed. Here's what happened. Okay, very quickly. Your trichotomy, three-part being, according to Paul. Body, that's what you're sitting up in. Your, your, your bones, your joints, your marrow, you're sitting in your earth suit. Right? This is body. This is body. Body. Soul, it's your personality. That's where you get, we get the Greek word, souche, get the, the word psychology comes from this. It means personality. And all of your personalities are beautifully different, praise God. Some of you are introverted. Some of you are extroverted. Some of you are a combination. But God, daughter, gave you the personality he gave you. He wired you up the way he did. Praise him. You're unique. You don't have to be like anybody else. God gave you the personality he gave you. So you have a soul. 
and you have a spirit. Why is this cup gray? No color. Why? Because at birth we are, we are broken. So you and I, ladies, we're a trichotomy, and we're in a pitiful mess in the bassinet. You come, beautiful daughter, made in God's image, broken. I'm broken, you're broken. The world is broken. And God told them, he said, as sure as you do it, you're going to be spiritually cut off from me. So what on earth does it mean to be born again, to be a Christian? What did Jesus mean by that? You can go to the slide, please, of the eye and the cross. When Jesus went to that cross, perfect man, sinless man, tempted in every way that you ever could be and beyond what you would be, chose to die, daughter, This is amazing love. Amazing. I've never gotten over it. I cannot get over it. Dad spitting in his face. Do you know how crazy I was at one time in my life? Do you know Jesus probably could have walked by and I went, I was so wounded. I had no idea about his fatherhood. Do you understand the miracle? Just belonging to him as his daughter? What it cost him? He gets it. So he died, daughter, so you could live. And he said, you know what? You get me, you get royalty. Purple, king. And the great exchange is you get to wear his clothes. And you get to live with him forever. Daughter. This is the climax of God's story. The day he died and the day that you acknowledge that. And when you acknowledge that and you agree with him, yeah, broken mess, yeah, need you desperately, what if it's not all about color? Things change for you. And so after the climax of knowing him, because there's no greater mountaintop, hear me, there's no job, there's no A on a test, there's no boyfriend, there's no car, there's no clothes, there's no sporting event, there's no social media post that outmatches this. It's the climax. It's the great exchange. My mess for your crown. What? Are you kidding me? You don't have anything to bring to him but a mess. What can you give to a holy God? It took me a long time to figure that out. I thought I could bring my good works. I thought I could bring my prayers. I thought I could bring my Bible verses. He said, I don't want that. I want your heart. And the day I began to understand that was the day things changed for me. I was a daughter. Next slide, war slide, please. I don't know if you can see that. That's a pretty powerful picture. You got a cross, which is the climax of God's story. You got a lion in there representing, I guess, Aslan from the Chronicles of Narnia, and it, it would be God. And you've got a warrior S. Look carefully, ladies. She's got blood on her hands. 
that is not necessarily a pleasant picture. But you see, in the rising action, before you knew about the cross of Christ, and maybe even after because your flesh was still getting lined up, you and I have spat in the face of God and we've made our own decisions. And every time I got crooked with God, go back to that heart picture, please. Every time I got crooked with God, it was as if somebody took my heart. Boy. And our Redeemer... He says, there's none of your messed up situations. There's none of your missed opportunities. There's none of your mistakes that are going to keep me from you, daughter. As a matter of fact, my purpose, because I'm pursuing you like a bloodhound in the falling action. After the cross, all things resolved, right? Heading toward the great conclusion. And God says, there's nothing you have done or will do after you've gone through that cross that will keep me from you. And my purpose and my plan for you as you exist in the miracle state of belonging to me as a daughter. Can I teach you something that God taught me for you? Because, see, I don't know you. I don't know you. I know where this church is, and I know how to put the GPS in, and I know how to get here, and I know what God says. But I don't know you. God knows you. Intimately. And when I'm sitting in my chair where I sit and I listen, like, I'm like, God, you know those ladies. You know those daughters in Bluffton. What do they need to hear from you? Two big things. Two big things he said. He said, you enter the right, if you understand the right father story, you'll enter the right daughter story. And the second thing he, he said is, I want you to teach them this. You know what this sign means? What? It means okay. Everything okay, right? A okay, right? It's an emoji, right? Okay. Everything's okay. God wants you to know this, Bluffton ladies. This is what he told me sitting in my chair. He said, I want you to teach them this. Put up your hand. Ever which one you use, right or left. I want you to take your pinky, your ring finger, and your middle finger for these first th three things. Okay, make a fist. And when I raise my finger, I want you to miss. There's, there's five words in here that start with an M. And this could be like your secret handshake sign, but this is a message to you from God. He gave it to me sitting in my gold chair. None of my mistakes, missed moments, or messed up situations will ever keep me from God's purpose Take your finger and point from God's purpose, direction, purpose. And the miracle I exist in is being belonging to him as daughter. And everything's going to be okay. Let's do it again. None of my mistakes, missed moments, or messed up situations will ever deter God from his purpose and the miracle I am belonging to him as daughter. It's going to be okay. Josie, you can come back and play. Where are you?
because I want to talk to you about my favorite part of the meta narrative. You see, in the exposition, what a birth plan. What? Oxygen, food, fish. Can't get over it. hunted you down he said I've done it perfect dinner for two Melita Starbucks coffee this is your dad and we blew it we blew it if you would have been in that garden you were Eve you and I would have done it too we blew it he didn't stop he didn't. Seconds after the fall, he was prophesying, say, Jesus is going to come and rescue my daughters. And if you know him and you get the purple cup, you've gone through that cross and all things will be redeemed. And every single moment of your life from that point to the resolution your mistakes, your missed moments, the shame Satan's brought on you, the messy situations will not keep you from his purpose and the miracle you exist in, the longing to his daughter. So let's pray. So the resolution, what is it when you belong to God as daughter? Because you see from Jesus forward, he redeems everything that's been lost. And I can look at your faces and I can tell you some of you have lost some stuff. I can see it. I don't know what you've lost. I don't know what's broken your heart. But God knows. And he says, you're my daughter. I'll redeem every piece of it. Not an ill word spoken to you doesn't go by my ears. I'll redeem it. Beautiful picture in Revelation of the Lamb, the Redeemer, walking in and taking that scroll. So I'm going to get a little bit personal with you right now, and I told you would because I told you I'd tell you a little bit about my own experience. And I hope you'll be encouraged by this. You see, as a daughter... I didn't get my perfect. My dad died two years ago of cancer. And he came to Charleston to live with us while he was being treated. But a daughter growing up in those Appalachian mountains that I grew up in, I was one of those who, Daddy, Daddy, not disturbed. heart was in a thousand pieces and it really caused me to act out in a lot of ways I take full responsibility but guys if, if you are operating if you are acting out in sin it's usually because you, you've got a wound because you're made for love you're made for love and sometimes we'll do anything to get it and I can tell you as a daughter growing up in a home where dad's sign on the door was do not disturb. I spent a lot of time with my brother because my brother played sports. And I know daddy loved me. But I didn't have that understanding that I needed to, that I was valued as a daughter. So it's kind of funny. The last six months of daddy's life, we always maintained a pretty good relationship because there's alcohol in the fun, in the home there's infidelity you name it crazy stuff I had no idea no idea of my value to my dad or my heavenly dad but daddy showed up in Charleston and he was dying of cancer you want to talk about redemption daughters because see God takes the pieces the broken pieces and he puts 
puts them back together. And I didn't know this was coming, but Daddy laid in my house, dying of cancer, tears rolling down his face. And I pulled up a chair, and day after day after day, I just talked to Daddy. And you know what I learned? I learned a story about him that I never knew. I learned a story that his mother had been raped as a teenage girl. And she entered a marriage that was very rocky. She never came to see him play sports. My dad was a college baseball player. My dad entered a bad marriage. I learned the history. And Daddy told me for the first time as a 52-year-old woman, he said, you know I love you and you're the apple of my eye. What? What? I never knew that. But for the first time in my life, I understood his pain. I understood his story. And I understood mine. And when Daddy went into glory, he was a Christian who knew the Lord. There was so much peace. He came in that room. He was safe with Jesus. And the beautiful part is when God stepped in, all that pain, all those hurts, I can't even tell you, ladies. It was supernatural. It went away. I can't even remember it now. I can't even remember. I sat with you for five minutes. It's really hard telling what you could tell me. (laughs) I don't know what your father's story is. But I know when you understand the right father's story, you enter. We're going to close. And I want you to spend this time either in your chair. You might feel like getting alone over there somewhere by yourself. I'm not sure what God's going to lead you to do. But the Lord God Almighty He wants to restore you as a daughter. He will split hell, heaven, you name it, wide open to come to you. Nothing. understand that you have a daddy that's this interested in you and valuing you you will begin to act like the daughter you are because you see daughterhood is really about fatherhood and some of you much God loves you. Liz, I'm going to ask you to come and close this out. And I want you to pray. I want you to spend some time with God. And there's one, two, or three places you are in story. You're here. He created. You're in it. You're in the meta narrative. You are either rising action and you've never gone through the cross before. And if you don't go through the cross, ladies, you'll never get to the resolution. Will you put that screen, that slide back up, please, Gabe? Five points. 
You're, one, you're somewhere on that graph. You're in the rising action, broken, and you've never gone through the cross and received Christ. Or you've gone through the cross and you're in the falling action and you have no idea what to do with the broken pieces of your heart. God's saying, I want to redeem it. There's a masterful resolution. So Liz is going to lead us in that. She's going to close us out. And I really want you to get alone and think about where you are in God's meta narrative. Beautiful God. Sometimes this can be a really hard message to listen to because whether it's you don't have a father figure or maybe it's not a great relationship or it's not how you want to be or maybe you do have that father figure but you're still trying to figure out how to be a daughter. And all of our earthly views with our dad can kind of skew how we view our God in heaven. So I'm going to pray for us here in a few minutes. And whether you're in that spot of, God, I'm broken, I need a dad. God, I'm broken, I know you're my dad, but I need to learn how to be a daughter. Or God, I know how to be a daughter, but I just need to know how much you love me. And I need to be reminded of that right now. We're all in this same spot of brokenness. And we can all relate on brokenness. We're, We're in a sinful world, but we have a God that's a redeemer. So we can all relate with that. So that's this cool thing about coming together is because we have each other in this, even if we all have different stories within it. So we're going to have a few songs here in a few minutes. And during that time, I just want you to get before the Lord. It might be just sitting in your chair crying or looking around. Could be just kind of getting on your knees and opening up your hands. And God, I just need you to pour out your love on me. Maybe I'm a walker. I like to walk around when I think. So if you need to walk around or get in a corner, you can do that. If you need to lay on the floor because you just don't know what else to do, you can do that. You can come up here and worship. Whatever that looks like for you, that's what this space is for. We're going to have leaders that are standing right behind the chairs. So if you need to talk to someone, talk to them. Hope and I will be here. If you need to talk to us, talk to us. But this is a time for you and for the Lord and for the Lord to take that heart that's inside of you and just show you his love. If you don't know what else to do, if you don't know what spot you're at in the story, if you don't know what who dad is, if you don't know what God is, just sit here and let God show you how much he loves you. How proud of you he is. We have these different pieces. And the cool thing that I love about these different pieces is Whatever state you're in or however yours looks, he loves you just the same. Whether this part of the cup is broken and torn and dented, whether it's black or white or purple or green, he loves it just the same. It says he created us from our mother's wombs. And do you think he would create something that he couldn't love? If he created you in your mother's womb, would he create something other than exactly what he wanted? So let's pray real quick, and then we'll just go into that time where you can be with the Lord. So Jesus, first I want to pray for my friends tonight. Maybe they don't know you quite yet. They're not really sure about you. They don't really know who you are or what you're here for or why you would have any reason to love them, Jesus. But I just pray right now that you will show up and you will speak out. That you would wrap your arms around them, Lord, and you would instill in them your love. They don't have to know anything or answer any facts, Jesus. All they need to know right now is you love them. they're ready to make that step tonight and walk in daughterhood, all they have to say is yes. God, I want to be a daughter. It doesn't cost us a thing but to step up and step out and say, yes, God, 
I'm ready to enter this free adoption. So if that's you tonight, I'm going to say a prayer real quick. You can say it out loud. You can say it in your head, whatever that looks like for you. Just say it with the Lord. Jesus, I'm not sure who I am, and I'm not sure what I've done or why I've done it, but I'm ready for you to take over these mistakes, these missed things. I'm confused and I'm lost, but I'm lost because I don't have you, Lord, and I'm ready for that. So Jesus, I lay down my sin in front of you. I lay down those things that I've messed up, and I just say, God, I'm ready to be a daughter. I believe in you, and I believe in your Son and your Holy Spirit, and I'm ready to walk in that. So Jesus, I accept you tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you've known the Lord, whether your whole life or just for a few months, but you've really walked astray. You have that certificate that says, I follow Jesus, but it's just kind of tucked away and you don't act like it whatsoever. Or maybe you do act like it, but inside you really don't know who the Lord is right now and you're really not walking as a daughter. You don't come to your dad and your dad, God dad, and sit in his lap and talk to him and spend time with him. You think things that you know you shouldn't be thinking because they're not the truth. You do things that maybe you shouldn't do because they're not how the Lord is calling you. So maybe right now in this moment, you just need to come back to the Lord and come back to him as a daughter. Our God isn't a God that has a shut door. He's not a God that walks out on us. But he's a God who's always sitting right there in the chair in the living room, ready to take us in his arms. So if that's you tonight, pray this with me. Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry I walked away, but I already accept your forgiveness and your love. And I know that you've been standing right here beside me this whole time. That although may, I maybe tried to run, you followed me. The false thinkings that I have of you and myself and the things that I've done out of anger or pride or just my sinful nature, Lord, I give those back to you. And I accept your forgiveness and I stand and I say right now I am forgiven and I am loved and I am accepted by my Father God Jesus I pray for all of my friends tonight all of these fellow daughters in the room no matter what state we're at right now Jesus I just pray that you will come you will wrap your arms around us and you will show us your love Jesus we might be walking in pride or bitterness or anger different things, whether it's how we view ourselves, how we view others, physical, sinful acts, whether we're going out on the weekends and doing things we shouldn't or texting things we shouldn't be sending out, Jesus, posting things we shouldn't have. But Jesus, we know you've already forgiven us for those things, so we just lay them down in front of you. Would you teach us your truths about those situations, that you call us beautiful, you call us chosen, we're secure in you. We have peace in you. We're accepted and we're loved by you, Jesus. The world can be a hard place to live in, Lord, but I can stand fast and I can stand secure because I am a daughter of you above all else. Lord, we love you and we thank you for tonight. It's in your son's name that we can worship you now. Amen.